Hey guys, I'm Ray Belli, and I'm the host of the Words for Granted podcast. Ryan has graciously given me the opportunity to tell all of you a little bit about my show, so let me get right to it. Words for Granted is a linguistics podcast that looks at how words change over time. Each episode looks at the evolution of a single word. When we use a word, any word, we seldom ask ourselves where that word came from. We seldom ask ourselves what that word used to mean or what it used to sound like a hundred years ago or 300 years ago or 3,000 years ago. Of course, most of the words that we use on a daily basis can be traced back this far. Sometimes the history of a word will take us to England, France, Rome, or, of course, to Greece, among many other places. Now, luckily for you, you won't need a degree in linguistics in order to enjoy words for granted. Instead of using academic linguistic terminology, I rely on history and culture as a way of understanding language, more specifically, language change. After all, words are influenced by real people, real societies, and real historical events, so in a way, if we're looking from the right angle, we can say that words are like little windows into the past. This idea that if words could speak, they'd have stories to tell, is what first sparked my interest in this topic many years ago, and it's the foundational premise of my show. I hope this little introduction sparks the same interest in you, and that you take a listen. Earlier this year, Ryan actually contributed to one of my episodes on the topic of tyranny. As listeners of the History of Ancient Greece podcast, that might be a great place for you to jump in. Again, the podcast is called Words for Granted, and you can find it on all major podcasting platforms. Thanks, Ryan. Over to you. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 57, Classical Paintings. Another important area of ancient Greek art is painting, both on vases and on walls. While we know quite a lot about the former, until fairly recently, our knowledge of the great paintings that decorated the interior walls of ancient Greek temples and public buildings was mainly relying upon literary descriptions, which failed to convey any real sense of the technical quality of the originals. But recent excavations at Paestum and Vergina have given us at least some direct evidence of these murals. Even so, when we talk about Greek painting, we tend to think first of the relatively humble medium of vase painting, which happens to be far more durable. Vase painting, in addition to its artistic merits, is of great significance to use as historical evidence, as they are painted with religious, mythological, and everyday subjects. Vases in those days were the main type of container for commercial products, whether it was liquid, like wine or olive oil, or dry, like grain. In fact, pottery fulfilled the functions carried out by a whole range of materials nowadays, such as cardboard, plastics, tin, and glass. Obviously, pottery had many domestic uses, and it was widely employed in matters of religion, such as to hold wine at ceremonies or for ornamental vases in temples or tombs. Because pottery does not decay, even if it frequently breaks, an enormous quantity has been found, over 100,000 vases at this moment, and a great amount of historical knowledge is based on its interpretation by archaeologists. The place of discovery, the depth at which it was buried, and the nearby objects are all valuable information, especially since a good deal is known about the dating of styles and types of pottery. 
Pottery existed in every town and village of Greece, who each had their own local characteristics. But the great success of Athenian black figure and then red figure vases in the 6th century BC on the international trade market drove other workshops to the wall. In fact, Athenian vases have been found all over the Mediterranean, in places as far apart as Spain and Asia, showing quite clearly the commercial and political power of the city, as well as the high quality of their pottery. Previously, in the geometric and archaic periods, pottery from Corinth had been the most widespread, as we discussed in episode 17. The Corinthians also developed their own red figure technique, and it did enjoy a certain local popularity, but that did not last long. Eventually, they adopted the Attic red figure style, and so too did the workshops throughout the rest of Greece. So does to Athens, once again, where we must direct our attention. In vase painting, we are often ignorant of the identity of the artist whose work we admire. In some cases, though, the potter or painter signed the vase, usually in phrases like ex egraphsin or ex decorated it, for the painter, and ex epoesin or ex made it, for the potter. Inscriptions of these kinds are very small and were either incised or painted on the vase. Sometimes the same person decorated and made the vase, but those instances are rare, and so vase painters are often known simply by the subject matter of their most memorable works, or the places that these works were found. They were given their names in the early 1900s by classicist John Beasley. Although there are dozens of vase painters flourishing in the 5th century BC, we will only mention a handful of them. It just doesn't behoove me to discuss them all, and so we will focus on a few of the more famous pieces or the contributions of the painters who had large stylistic influences. Of course, this is very subjective, so don't be offended if your favorite painter or vase is not mentioned. Anyways, other forms of painted writing by the artist were commonly used to indicate the names of the figures shown, the subject matter, words spoken by the figures, or even a greeting to anyone looking at the vase. The shapes of the vases fell into a number of standard types, depending on their practical purpose. The storage and transport jars were the amphora, the neck amphora, the pithos, the paliki, and the stamnos. The water jars were the hydria and the lotrophoros. The bowls used for mixing wine and water were the volute crater, the bell crater, and the dinos. Jugs were the oenokoi and the ope. Drinking cups were the kylix, the stemless kylix, and the cantharos. Perfume bottles were the aribolus, the alabastron, the lekythos, and the squat lekythos, and the cosmetic vase was the pyxix. Another form of pottery very common throughout the Greek world was that of small terracotta or baked earth figures. Used as offerings to gods, toys, ornaments, or buried with the dead, they too were originally painted, although the colors have mostly faded from the surviving pieces. Like vases, they had a wide variety of styles and subjects, and are valued both as works of art and as historical evidence. The clay used in Athens contained a high level of iron, so that it produced a reddish color when fired in the kilns. At first, this was left as the background, and figures were painted in black. From about 525 BC onwards, the reverse came to be more popular, as the background was glazed black and the figures were left in the red color, with the details shown in black lines. The first generation of red figure painters worked in both red and black figure, as well as other methods, including the white ground technique. There will be more on that later. However, within 20 years, experimentation had given way to specialization, as seen in the vases of the group that the scholars call the Pioneers. If you recall from episode 17, these vase painters were called the Pioneers because of their daring attempts at new poses and views in their newly designed red figure technique. In fact, their work was almost exclusively in red figure, though they retained the use of black figure for the production of Panathenaic amphorae. At the tail end of the Archaic period, the pupils of the pioneers began to come to the fore, and this next generation of late Archaic vase painters took it a step further by bringing an increasing naturalism to their artwork. And so, like sculpture, vase painting of the early 5th century BC was focused on the human figure, to which the surfaces of the vessels lent a sense of movement and grace. Even more so than in drama, though, the possibilities of facial expression are limited by the medium of pottery, and character portrayal is thus weak. We are often given a clear sense of what the persona on the vase are experiencing at the moment in time the artist has chosen to capture, but little understanding of who they have been over their lifetimes, and what their driving anxieties or concerns were. 
The figures on Greek vases are portrayed in action, not contemplation. They almost never appear to be posing for the artist, and we must ask ourselves not only what they are thinking and what they are feeling, but also what has just happened and what will happen next. But the focus always remains on the human being. Landscapes are rarely developed in any substantial way, and though animals often appear as the companions of humans, they are rarely the center of attention, as they once had been. The late Archaic period also saw the specialization of painters into those who worked on larger pots and those who worked on smaller cups. Of the former, the Cleophagres painter and the Berlin painter are considered by many as the most talented large vase painters of the early 5th century BC. The Cleophagres painter was active from around 510 to 470 BC, and over 200 vases have been attributed to him. He was given his name from a potter's inscription of Cleophrates on a cup now in the Louvre. He is thought to have been the son of the potter Amasis. Although he was not a member of the pioneers, it is believed that he worked in their workshop. In fact, he seems to have been a pupil of Euthymides, one of the pioneers, as his earliest work greatly resembles that of his master in technique and style. Working in the generation after the pioneers, the work of the Cleophagres painter represents a period of consolidation after one of great experimentation and innovation. Remaining close to his pioneer roots, he had a conservative approach, often implementing their techniques. He favored decorating large vases, such as craters, hydrias, and amphorae, the same shapes painted by Euthymides. In subject matter, he tended to paint traditional scenes drawn from the pioneers, but with a new emphasis on scenes from the Trojan War. The attribution of his work is particularly identifiable through the study of their faces. Although he predominantly worked in the red figure technique, he was also trained as a black figure and white ground technique painter. As we mentioned before, the black figure technique was still being widely used in Panathenaic amphorae. They featured a depiction of the event for which it was the prize, and on the opposite side had an image of Athena. The Panathenaic amphorae by the Cleophagres painter can be recognized by the representation of Pegasus on the shield of Athena the manner in which her hair is represented, and the position of the spear behind her head. The Cleophagres painter himself also had pupils, the most famous of which was the Berlin painter. He was active from around 490 to 460 BC, and over 400 vases have been attributed to him. The majority of the works of both the Cleophagres painter and the Berlin painter have been found particularly across Italy, preserved alongside exquisite grave goods in Magna Graecia and Etruria. This might suggest that their works were created specifically for export to the Italian market, or it could just be a coincidence. Either way, the Berlin painter received his name from a large lidded amphora that was housed in the Berlin Antiquities Collection. On one side, Hermes strides to the right, swinging his arms. He holds a large cantharos and his wand, called the Kerkion, in his forward hand, and a small jug of wine in his other hand that he swings behind him. He is dressed in a short tunic and a clamus and he wears his winged cap and winged boots. A satyr stands in front of him, facing right with his head turned to the left. He is holding a barbiton in one arm with his fingers across the strings. He has a long beard and wears a wreath, and his right leg is shown in three-quarters view. A fawn stands between the two figures, with its head gracefully turned up. The figures are all superimposed on one another, forming a unified contour isolated against the black background of the vase. Above them is a band of ivy leaves and grape bunches. Fawns and other Greek animals are popular themes in the Berlin painter's works, which varied from mythological themes to athletics. The Berlin painter also produced a series of Panathenaic amphorae. His Athena, though, was always depicted with a gorgon shield. In addition to Athena, many of his vases deal with Apollo. He too concentrated on larger vessels, like these amphorae, and he liked to paint elegant single figures or small groups on ground lines against a background so dark that the effect is one of spotlighting. In doing so, he continued to explore space, expressions of mood, and the body in motion. His figures take up most of the body and even continue over the shoulder, stopping at the neck. He pays close attention to the drapery of clothing and facial features. Three-quarter views of faces and feet increase the sense of depth in two-dimensional images. He is also known for his key patterns, which border the bottom of his figures, something that is unique to the Berlin painter and his students. The specialization of the Cleophagres painter and the Berlin painter in larger vessels is paralleled by that of others in smaller ones, especially in kilixes or cups. 
Onesimus, and the Brygos painter were among the finest cup painters of the early classical period. Onesimus flourished from around 500 to 480 BC. He frequently decorated cups potted by the pioneer Euphronius, and seems to have learned many elements of his painting style from him. Continuing the work of his master and the other pioneers, Onesimus favored active poses and realistic renderings of the human body, including elements such as body hair and receding hairlines. His mythological depictions were innovative. Many myths appear for the first time in his work. In his later works, Onesimus emphasized scenes of everyday life, especially the symposium, the comos, or the drunken procession at the Dionysia, warriors, scenes of youths, athletes, and erotica. The Brigos painter was active from around 490 to 470 BC, and over 200 vases have been attributed to him. Although most of his works are chelixes, he also painted other vase shapes, such as skiphoi, cantharoi, rita, and a number of lekithoi. The signature of Brigos has been found on 16 vessels, and is accompanied by the word epoesin, which suggests that Brigos was the potter, and thus he is called the Brigos painter though some scholars think the potter and the painter may be one and the same person. Regardless, he was one of the earliest red figure artists who weren't in direct contact with the pioneers. Instead, he learned his craft from Onesimus, and he himself became quite influential and was the center of a large circle of painters, who were either influenced by him or may have even worked with him at the workshop of the potter at Brigos. Included among them was the so-called foundry painter, whose famous work, the Berlin Foundry Cup, we discussed last episode. The Brigos painter enjoyed decorating some of his cups with mythological scenes, and perhaps his best known is the so-called Brigos Killix, found in the Louvre Museum in Paris, that depicts the Sack of Troy. He was also fond of athletes, warriors, symposia, and Dionysic revelry and drinking, a suitable ornament, obviously, for a cup. His work is easily recognizable by the dots that he sprinkles on the cloaks that his characters wear. He paints in crisp, wavy lines and is a master of mood. This can be illustrated quite vividly in another of his cups, which is also found in the Louvre Museum in Paris. It shows a violent scene on the one side, where satyrs are so aroused that they attack the goddesses Iris and Hera, and another sympathetic scene on the other side, which displays the somber mood of the unfortunate effects of a night out on the town. Many of his figures also clearly display the effects of age. Stubbly beards or stubbly hair on old men, as well as signs of balding, are found on numerous cups. He is also one of the first, and very few, of the painters who successfully painted children to look truly like children, and not like small adults. He was also skilled in painting the human mouth, as his figures are shown whistling, singing, blowing, or clenching their lips, all with a high degree of anatomical accuracy. All of this indicates that the Brigos painter was a skilled observer of human emotion, expression, and interaction. He also had a greater interest in spatial effects and setting than his contemporaries. By using dilute glaze washes to show three-dimensionality, his painting technique comes close to shading. The Pisto Zenos painter was active around 480 to 460 BC, and he too came from the workshop of Euphronius and Onesimus. He received his name from a Siphos that was inscribed with the potter's signature of Pistozinos. He too specialized in Kylix cups, in the red figure style, with a focus on the motifs of horses, warriors, and Dionysic revelry. However, some of his best pieces were produced in the white ground technique. Included among those is the famous image of Apollo with his lyre and a raven, while pouring a libation. It dates to around 480 BC and is now found in the Delphi Archaeological Museum. He was one of the first painters to employ four-color polychromy, using slip, paints, and gilding. The style often resembles monumental painting. There'll be more shortly on the white ground technique and monumental painting. As we can see, by the classical period, a number of distinct schools, or workshops, had evolved. While the school of the Berlin painter and his peers and pupils favored a naturalistic pose, one group of painters, on the other hand, among whom the pan painter was prominent, preferred old-fashioned conventions and looked back admiringly to the 6th century BC. They held on to archaic features, such as stiff drapery and awkward poses, and combined that with exaggerated gestures. The pan painter was active from around 480 to 450 BC, and over 150 vases have been attributed to him. 
He received this name because of his connection to the red figure vase known as the Pan Bell Crater, which dates to around 470 to 460 BC, and is currently being housed at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. On the one side is an image of the goat god Pan, chasing a young shepherd, wearing a fawn skin and a hat. Pan is clearly sexually excited by the shepherd, and his excitement is accented by the herm behind him. A herm is a stone or wood shaft with the head of the god Hermes, rudimentary arms, and a large carved phallus. Apart from its religious significance, which is poorly understood, a herm often stood to mark boundaries and intersections of roads. The other side of the vase shows Artemis, the virgin goddess of the moon and the hunt, and the sister of Apollo, slaying the hunter Actaeon of Thebes. According to the myth, Actaeon stumbled upon Artemis nude while bathing in the woods, and so the abashed goddess turned him into a stag, at which point he was torn apart by his own hunting dogs. The pan painter combines two parts of the myth into a tragic singular moment. The enraged Artemis drawing her bow and confronting the hero who falls and cries out for mercy, and his death as his dogs attack him. He is shown as a human to help identify him as Actaeon, although he technically should be a stag. The overall composition wouldn't be as dramatic if he was a stag, though. The images on this face are considered by many scholars to be the greatest of all of the works of the pan painter because of how its composition was skillfully manipulated to fit the curves of the bell crater. Another vase, datable to the same period, exemplifies the work of another innovative potter, known as Citades. He favored vases with modeled parts, such as the red figure Sphinx Riton in the British Museum in London. As the name implies, it was a statuette of a sphinx that was transformed into a drinking vessel and decorated as such. Between the creature's legs, there is an image of a running satyr, and sitting on top of the creature's back is a vase that has an image of the legendary king of Athens, the snake-tailed Kecrops, and his daughters. It was a pouring vessel, as shown by the hole at the front between the legs of the sphinx. Closed by a stopper, it would have been filled with wine at the top, which poured out through the hole in the bottom when the stopper was removed. So Tadis made numerous vases like this, following a practice that had flourished in the Orientalizing period. Just as then, contact with the Near East was providing stimulation. He used a lot of red and white paint, and his works were exported far and wide. This one in particular was found in Italy, while other examples of his have been found in Egypt, Cyprus, and the Greek colonies on the coasts of the Black Sea. In the same decade, the Niobid painter attempted to convey space and depth in a bold and daring new way. He was active from around 470 to 450 BC and received his name from the so-called Niobe Crater, now housed in the Louvre in Paris. It shows Apollo and Artemis slaughtering the children of Niobe. This story is rarely represented in Greek art, and this crater is arguably its most famous representation. Niobe, the daughter of Tantalus and the sister of Pelops, had boasted once that she was far superior to the goddess Leto because she had produced seven boys and seven girls, while Leto only had two. Unfortunately, for her, those were Apollo and Artemis, though. And so her act of hubris invited divine retribution, and here we see its enactment, as Leto sent her two children to kill the fourteen of Niobe. On one side, Artemis is taking an arrow from her quiver, while Apollo is drawing his bow. One Niobid takes an arrow in the back, while others lie dead, littering the field. The painter has distributed his figures over the surface of the vase in various postures and on various wavy ground lines. The old convention of a single ground line has been discarded and replaced by multiple ones, obviously intended, with a spectral tree shown at the top of the scene to suggest landscape and space. The other side shows Athena, Heracles and his companions, similarly arranged over the surface. They are shown at ease, a quiet scene that contrasts quite significantly with the active violence of Artemis and Apollo on the other side. The Niobid painter also attempted to draw the scenes in three-dimensional space by adding multiple levels to the landscape. This change, no doubt, was inspired by contemporary wall and panel paintings, which also used multiple level compositions. However, this feature did not become popular in vase painting, and the other works of the Niobid painter used a single ground line. In these, he shows a preference for scenes of the Amazon Amaki, using three-quarter view faces. Moving away from vase painting for a moment, let's shift our attention to non-pottery forms of painting. The tradition of wall painting in Greece goes back to the Bronze Age with the Minoan and Mycenaean cultures. 
We're unsure, though, whether there's any continuity between these and later Greek wall paintings, as we know very little about wall painting in the Archaic period. But by the Classical period, the Greeks seem to have valued painting above even sculpture, and by the Hellenistic period, the informed appreciation and even the practice of painting were components in education. The ekphrasis became a literary form that gave vivid, often dramatic descriptions of a work of art, and we have a considerable body of literature on Greek painting and painters. Although there are descriptions of major wall paintings from the classical period that managed to survive, at least until the 3rd century AD, today we have hardly any of these type of paintings, on wood panel or in fresco, that this literature was concerned with, partially due to the perishable nature of the materials used and the major upheavals at the end of antiquity. The most important surviving Greek examples are the Pizza Panels, the Tomb of the Diver from Paestum, and the various paintings from the Royal Macedonian Tombs at Vergina. Furthermore, there are numerous Etruscan tombs that have paintings based on Greek styles. In the Roman period, there are a number of wall paintings in Pompeii and the surrounding area, as well as in Rome itself, that are thought to have been copies of earlier Greek masterpieces. And so our idea of what the best Greek painting was like must be drawn from a careful consideration of parallels in vase painting, later Roman copies in mosaic and fresco, some very late examples of actual painting in the Greek tradition, and the ancient literature. The names of leading painters are recorded, which contrasts sharply with vase painters, who we only know somewhat through their signatures and who aren't even mentioned in literature at all, but due to the medium they painted on have survived to this day. One of the earliest recorded names is Polygnatus. He developed painting to such an extent that many ancient sources labeled him, albeit erroneously, as the originator of this type of art. Regardless, ancient critics suggest that facial expression was more varied in this medium than in sculpture and vase painting, particularly after Polygnotus liberated it from traditional archaic rigidity, depicting, for example, open mouths and even teeth. The Roman writer, Pliny the Elder, wrote that nobody gained any fame by painting directly on walls, meaning frescoes, but only on portable wooden panels that were hung up on walls. So it's likely that Polygnotus mostly painted on these type of panels, and only sometimes painted on frescoes. Regardless, he was considered a master painter by the Hellenistic and Roman commentators who saw his work. In fact, the Roman rhetorician Quintilian later advised serious students of painting to begin with Polygnotus. Unfortunately, as you might expect, all of his paintings are lost. What we know of his work, though, comes largely from descriptions of Pausanias, a travel writer in the 2nd century AD whose work called The Description of Greece is the principal source for many of the artworks that no longer survive today. Polygnotus in a circle employed simple colors, as they used only a four-color palette of red, yellow, black, and white. And so technically speaking, his art was primitive, but his excellence laid in the beauty of his drawing of individual figures, and he was much admired for his use of posture and gesture to create character portrayal in his vivid and complex murals. For example, Pliny reported that Polygnotus was the first to portray women draped in transparent clothing the so-called wet t-shirt look. He also painted figures in multicolored clothing. Aristotle considered that the painter depicted ethos, or character, because as he noted, Polygnotus's figures portrayed individual emotions. The Roman writer, Aelianus, described his art as having precision, passion, and ethos. Another Roman, the satirist Lucian, observed that he elaborated the garments of his characters in great detail. His exploration of space and the use of perspective by putting figures on different levels to suggest depth without reducing their size marked him out as an innovator compared to most of his vase painting peers. The images on the Niobid crater, as we have mentioned, may have been drawing on ideas developed by Polygnotus in a circle, or Polygnotus might have been a pupil of the Niobid painter. Regardless, the influence between the two mediums is clearly there. During the time of Cimon, Polygnotus painted beautiful images on many of the buildings in the Athenian Agora and on the Acropolis. We are not certain whether paintings were done on panels or directly into the walls, but most likely they were first executed on wooden panels that were then attached to the walls. According to Pausanias, after a sanctuary of Theseus, called the Theseon, was built close to the southeast corner of the Athenian Agora that flanked the Panathenaic Way, in collaboration with Mycon, another eminent painter, who also seemed to enjoy Cimon's patronage, Polygnitus decorated this building with life-size frescoes of Theseus. They did the same with the sanctuary of the Dioscori, called the Anakion, 
on the northeastern side of the Agora, near their Acropolis. The name of the temple derives from the Greek word anakes, meaning lords, a title often associated with the Dioscori in Attica. Mykon depicted the Argonauts, which the Dioscori were a part of, with particular attention to Akastos and his horses. Polygnotus depicted the abduction of the daughters of Leucippus of Messenia by the Dioscori. Plutarch mentions that Polygnotus did not paint for money, but rather out of a charitable feeling towards the Athenian people. However, he was under the patronage of Cimon, and although he was a native of Thassos, Polygnotus was adopted by the Athenians and admitted to their citizenship on account of the marvelous images that he painted in praise of Athens. Polygnotus also painted the walls of the Stoa Polykele in the Agora with images of the Greeks taking Troy, and his famous picture of the Battle of Marathon, which we discussed in episode 36. Even more famous, though, were Polygnotus's paintings after he had left Athens for Delphi, where he painted the Hall of the Canidians. The subjects were the visit of Odysseus to the Underworld and the Sack of Troy. Fortunately, Pausanias recorded a careful description of these two paintings, figure by figure. The placement of the figures creates perspective, as does the concealing of the lower parts of their bodies behind lines, showing the relief of the ground. And so the figures were detached and seldom overlapping, and ranged in two or three rows, one above the other. The farther were not smaller nor dimmer than the nearer. Therefore, it seems that the paintings of this time were executed on almost precisely the same plan as contemporary sculptural reliefs. Like at Athens, he received no monetary reward for his work, but rather was awarded the great honor of a Delphic ambassadorship. He later returned back to Athens, where he painted the great images inspired by the Homeric epics in the Pinacotheca, the northwestern wing of the Propylaea, which was the grand entrance onto the Acropolis. Polygnotus was also a contemporary of Phidias, and some scholars believe that he may have even taught him, as they both painted in the same grand manner on the Acropolis. At the very least, Phidias was influenced by him. There will be more on both of their works in the Acropolis in a future episode. Now, let's turn our attention to the surviving evidence of non-vase painting that we actually do have. The four so-called Pizza panels are a group of painted wooden tablets found in a cave near Pizza in the northern Peloponnese. Dating to around 540 to 530 BC, they are the earliest surviving examples of Greek panel painting. The wooden tablets are thin, covered with stucco, and painted with mineral pigments. Their bright colors are surprisingly well preserved. Only eight colors, black, white, blue, red, green, yellow, purple, and brown, are used, with no shading of any sort. Probably, the black contour lines were drawn first, and then filled in with colors. The tablets depict a sacrifice to a deity or nymphs, presumably of the cave. Three or more females, dressed in either a chiton or a peplos, are approaching an altar to the right. They are accompanied by musicians, playing the lyre and the aulis. The person nearest the altar appears to be pouring a libation from a jug. A small figure behind her, perhaps a slave, is leading a lamb, the sacrificial victim. An inscription in the Corinthian alphabet names two women dedicators, Euthydika and Eucolus, and states that the tablet, or the depicted offering, is dedicated to the nymphs. And so the tablets were votive offerings. Stylistically and technically, they probably represent rather low-quality panel paintings of their time. This, as well as references to wooden painted or inscribed votives and much larger Greek sanctuaries, indicates that the pizza tablets belong to the types of votive offerings readily available to the poorer sections of the population. Such simple votives may have been far more numerous originally, but the fact that they are made of perishable materials, whereas richer votives were of stone, bronze, or precious metals, has led to their near-total disappearance from the archaeological record. As the only pre-Roman panel painting to have survived, it represents virtually all of our evidence for this style of art. Incidentally, the Greeks believed that panel painting was invented in Sicyon, not far from Pizza. From Pastum, or Poseidonia in Greek, in southern Italy, comes the only substantial and complete example of Greek wall painting of the 5th century BC that has survived. The so-called Tomb of the Diver, dating to around 480 to 470 BC, is a grave made of five local limestone slabs, forming the four lateral walls and the roof. There are scenes of a typical symposium on its four sides, with a young man diving into a stream of water on the underside of the roof block, hence the name of the tomb. The south wall is less impressive than the north, so it's believed that two artists were used, with one more skilled than the other. 
Regardless, the slabs were painted using a true fresco technique, meaning that they were painted directly onto wet plaster. The background is a white stucco, and earth tones of brown, black, and yellow are the main colors used. Blue is used sparingly for couch covers and garments. Music, drinking, and love are the themes of the symposium, as we discussed in episode 48, and the diver scene represents the plunge from this life to the next. There are similarities of pose and profile with figures painted on vases in Athens at the end of the Archaic period, which suggests either that wall painters and vase painters shared the same style, or that this particular scene was created off of an image from a vase. Because as we have seen, scenes of symposia were illustrated quite frequently in vase paintings. Similarly, they could have been inspired by the many Etruscan painted tombs, as Paestum at the time was only a few miles from the border of the Greek and Etruscan spheres of influence at the River Sele. When the tomb was discovered in 1968, only a few objects were found, mostly pottery, which was what helped scholars to date the tomb. The tomb is now recreated, and along with its contents, they are now on display in the Archaeological Museum at Paestum. Wall paintings, such as the Tomb of the Diver at Paestum, were painted against a white background. The white background in vase painting had been used before in the 6th century BC, but it did not become popular. However, in the High Classical period, the white background really comes into its own, as some artists now preferred outline painting. Unlike the better-known black figure and red figure techniques, white background coloration was not achieved through the application and firing of slips but through the use of paints and gilding on a surface of white clay. Subjects were outlined using a special clay that was free of iron oxide instead of the common reddish clay, typical of Attica. The white gives a more naturalistic effect than the techniques prior and allows for the addition of bright colors, which were applied after the vessel is fired, and therefore it flakes off very easily. The technique is used on several pot shapes, including the Oenoikoi and the crater. But since the white background itself is fragile and easily crumbled, this was an obvious disadvantage for pots that were designed to be handled a lot, and so it became primarily used for lekithoi, or tall flasks, that held oils and liquids for pouring out ritual libations, and were regularly deposited in graves as offerings. Some larger ones also appear to have been used as funerary markers. This meant that the lekithoi were not used as often, like a cup would have been, and so they could be decorated in the white background technique without fear that it would flake off and wear out from constant use. A lekithoi by the Achilles painter offers a good example of this. Dating to around 450 to 440 BC, it shows a handmaiden bringing a woman her jewelry box. This one is 15 inches high, so it was used for libations. Like the grave stella of Hegeso, it is a funerary monument portraying the deceased and how they acted in life. Gazes of both are directed downward. These white ground lekithoi generally show scenes appropriate for funerary context, and some carved reliefs even take the shape of lekithoi. By the end of the 5th century BC, red, black, and brown were in use for contours, and washes of green, blue, and purple were applied for broader swaths of drapery. This polychrome style may reflect the style of contemporary monumental murals and panels. Experiment went beyond color, though, as broken contour lines attempted to suggest volume, making figures stand out from the background. This may be a trick to learn from wall painting, since it seems to agree with the descriptions of the murals of Parasius, who was thought to have depicted volumes by lines, not by shading. Parasius worked in Athens during the Peloponnesian War and he was considered by many later critics to be one of the very best painters in ancient Greece. Many of his drawings on wood and parchment were highly valued by later painters for the purpose of study. His images were chiefly mythological, and his painting of Theseus was said to have later adorned the Capitoline Hill of Rome. Although Parasius depicted volume by lines, shading as a device for rendering volume in painting is attributed by literary sources to two other late 5th century BC wall painters, Zeuxis and Apollodorus. It only rarely appears on vases to suggest volume in humans, and even then not until the very end of the century. Little is known about the life of Apollodorus, but he was known by Plutarch as Apollodorus Skiagraphos, or the shadow painter, because of his greatest legacy, that being a shading technique that gave the illusion of both shadow and volume. As demonstrated by the known titles of his paintings, the majority of his works were similar to other artists of the era, those being famous scenes from myth. However, what set him apart was the type of shading that he applied to these paintings. It was highly sophisticated, and even today, people struggle to master skiagraphia. 
I'm not an art expert, so in layman terms, he used light and dark tones to show perspective. It was effective in the depiction of stationary objects, such as drapery, fruit, or faces, but it was ineffective in painting the body in action or a spatial setting. Also, Apollodorus may very well have been the first known artist to have painted on an easel-type object, rather than on a wall. According to Pliny, Apollodorus was a rival with Zeuxis. At one point, Pliny says that Apollodorus accused Zeuxis of stealing his techniques, which might be true because Zeuxis also was known for his expansion and development of Skiagraphia. He also may have been a pupil. Regardless, Zeuxis was from Heraclea, though the sources don't specify which of the roughly ten ancient cities bearing the name of Heraclea was his birthplace. Anyways, he was an innovative painter in his own right, and he was admired greatly by later art critics during the Roman period. In fact, most of his works were taken to the city of Rome later, but they disappeared after the time of Pausanias. His work is often spoken of as being kalos kagathos, literally beautiful and good. In other words, he was exemplary. Zeuxis was exceptional because of the various techniques that he invented to render his work. He expanded on skiagraphia by adding highlights to the shading and applying different colors subtly. In doing so, he created volumetric illusion through manipulating light and shadow, a change from the usual method of filling in shapes with flat color. His famous monochromes and white technique enabled him to depict figures on a white background. Preferring small-scale panels to murals, Zeuxis also introduced genre subjects, such as still life, into painting. He was once accused of taking a long time to complete his work by one of his subjects, so he retorted, that the creation of any work intended to last through time takes time. According to Pliny, Zeuxis and Parasius staged a contest to determine who was the greater artist. When Zeuxis unveiled his painting of grapes, they appeared so real that birds flew down to peck at them. But when Parasius, whose painting was concealed behind a curtain, asked Zeuxis to pull aside that curtain, the curtain itself turned out to be a painted illusion and impressed Zeuxis, acknowledged that he was surpassed, saying, quote, I have deceived the birds, but Parasius has deceived Zeuxis, end quote. This story was commonly referred to in 18th and 19th century art theory to promote spatial illusion in painting. A similar anecdote told by Pliny says that Zeuxis once drew a remarkable and compelling representation of a boy dallying with grapevines that fooled a flock of birds flying around them, so much so that they descended to peck at the painting. At this, Zeuxis was extremely displeased, stating that he must have painted the boy with less skill than the grapes, since the birds would have been feared to approach otherwise. Zeuxis also may have originated an approach to, and thus influenced the concept of, the ideal form of the nude. Legend has it that when the city of Croton invited Zeuxis to portray the beauty of the divine Helen, he wanted to see all of the maidens of the city nude, so as to select the most beautiful one to model. As the story goes, though, Zeuxis couldn't find a woman beautiful enough to pose as Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world, so he selected the finest features of five different models to create a composite image of ideal beauty. Croton wasn't the only place where his fame spread, as he was also invited by Archelaus, the king of Macedon, to come to Pella to decorate his palace there with a picture of Pan. Comically, Zeuxis was said to have died laughing at the humorous way he painted the goddess Aphrodite after the old women who commissioned it insisted on modeling for the portrait. The practice of painting vases using the red figure technique continued, but demand slowly declined. There are fewer and fewer signatures of painters in the second half of the 5th century BC, and by the following century, signatures of potters too had disappeared. The Achilles painter was a pupil of the Berlin painter, and he worked in both red figure and white ground lekithoi. He flourished around 470 to 425 BC, and over 200 vases have been attributed to him. His name vase is an amphora, now housed in the Vatican Museum. It dates to around 440 BC and shows Achilles, standing in solitary splendor, gazing pensively to the right, while shouldering his spear and with his right hand on his hip. He is standing on a meander ground line. The mood is close to the ideal calm of the Parthenon figures. More on that in a future episode while the stance is close to that of Polycletus's Doryphoros. So what we see here is vase painting starting to emulate statuary. It is believed that more than a dozen other recognizable painters were taught by or worked with him at his workshop. The Penthesilea painter was active between 470 and 450 BC, and about 180 vases have been attributed to him. 
He received his name from a bowl in Munich that depicts the slain of Penthesilea by Achilles. His work is characterized by large, space-filling figures whose posture is often bent, so as to permit them to fit on the vessel. His works are also characterized by being very colorful, which permits the painting of several intermediate shades. Apart from dark coral red and the usual light red, he also used tones of brown, yellow, yellowish white, and gold. His figures are painted remarkably meticulous in every detail. The Penthesilea painter's works are dominated by depictions of boys and youths engaged in athletic activities, educational scenes, and weaponry and armor, as well as scenes of horse riding. While he painted the occasional mythological motif, they are so rare that they should be considered an exception among his work. Throughout his career, scenes from everyday life made up an increasingly larger share of his paintings, and so his major importance for classical vase painting lies in the fact that he moved away from the usual motifs and replaced them with typical motifs from everyday life. His emphasis on human aspects represented a new departure, and he was to be an important influence on the further development of vase painting. Heroic and mythological scenes thereafter became less popular, and their place is taken by scenes of daily life. Our insight into the private lives of the Greeks owes much to these type of scenes that appear on hundreds upon hundreds of surviving vases. Unlike sculpture, painting was as likely to treat mundane scenes of daily activities as it was to portray deeds of epic proportions, and so social historians have a wealth of information about how people spent their time at work and at play, showing women and men in a variety of activities, such as shoemakers, blacksmiths, agricultural workers, and other laborers, who are portrayed going about their tasks. We are indebted to these vases for their numerous scenes from women's lives and images of domestic space. As we have mentioned before, many Greek artists in Athens were drawn to the theme of Theseus fighting the Amazons, placing it in the context of the ongoing conflict between West and East, Greek and Barbarian. Theseus was also depicted many, many times fighting the mythical creatures known as the centaurs, who sported human torsos on the bodies of horses. The association of women with foreigners and animals with barbarians, and the notion that Greek male identity could and should be asserted by setting oneself against them, would be repeated in Greek art and thought throughout the classical period. Because many Greek writers were often reticent in discussing women, visual images provide important clues to how women were thought of in ancient Greece. Vase paintings depict women of all social classes. Vases that were used at drinking parties, for the mixing and drinking of wine, frequently show prostitutes entertaining men. Some women are shown playing flutes, others are engaged in various stages of flirtation, and some scenes are frankly pornographic. Common prostitutes were often slaves. A woman of higher status, who nevertheless mingled with men and received pay for her services, was known as a tyra. Such women were likely to be medics, either ex-slaves or freeborn, who, like male medics, gravitated to Athens because it was a commercial center. A few of these women, like Aspasia, the mistress of Pericles, and the most famous Atira of them all, participated actively in the intellectual life of their male associates. In contrast, many paintings on vases used by respectable women depict scenes that represent their roles, such as wedding scenes or women visiting tombs or sitting in a home, spinning wool or adorning themselves, often in the company of other women. We won't go into depth about any specific vases here, as many of these images and what they help us to understand will be discussed in future episodes on topics of daily life. But I do want to draw special attention to a red figure hydria that dates to around 450 BC. It shows a woman on the far right painting an enormous kylix. Athena is in the middle as her role of goddess of the arts. The other male painters are being crowned by Nike for their victory. She is shown as being not on the same level as her male counterparts, which is typical throughout the Greek ethos. Regardless, it's important to point out that there were women painters in ancient Greece, and it's entirely possible that many of these anonymous vase painters that we have discussed were in fact female. Also, Pliny reported the names of six women who painted on walls. In particular, he records that Mycon's daughter, Timoretta, painted an image of Artemis on a mural in Ephesus. In the West, in the first half of the century, the Greeks of Magna Graecia had relied on imported painted pottery, but ceramics of Attic quality began to be produced in the cities of Magna Graecia towards the end of the 5th century BC. The appearance of this South Italian style of red figure pottery may be related to the foundation of Thurii in 443 BC, which we will cover in depth in a future episode, and perhaps potters and painters were involved in this colonial venture. Their appearance is certainly attested at Metapontum, which sat a little further northeast along the coast from Thurii, where some of their kilns have been found by archaeologists. 
At the very least, though, it is thought that the founders of those workshops were vase painters who had been trained, educated, and employed in Attica beforehand. If they didn't go westward for colonial reasons to Thurii, then it's possible that the political instability of the time in Athens may have caused them to migrate. Anyways, the Pasticci painter is considered the father of the Lucanian workshop, the oldest of the Italian workshops. Many of his pieces were discovered in Pasticci, a small town near Metaponum in Lucania, hence the name. It is believed that he trained in Athens with the school of Polygnotus, because his work is similar to theirs in both his techniques employed and the choice of themes. The scenes that he most commonly painted were pursuit scenes, where a god is pursuing after a female, quite often with the god Eros, and other mythological scenes, as well as the traditional scenes of Dionysian revelry, warriors, and athletes. The Pasticci painter's workshop also included other vase painters. One of those in particular was the Cyclops painter, who received his name from the so-called Cyclops Crater. It shows the drunken Cyclops Polyphemus at the bottom of the scene, and Odysseus and his companions at the top, maneuvering the great stake, with which they will ram into the giant's one eye, and thus blind him. The theme goes back to the Eleusis Amphora from the 7th century BC, and the arrangement of the figures up and down the surface goes back to painters like the Niobid painter, so dependence on Attic themes and style is shown here. New to the scene are figures of satyrs darting in from the right. Some have suggested that the scene may have been based on the satyr play of Euripides, titled Cyclops, which we discussed in detail in episode 52. Anyways, there is also evidence of another workshop that was perhaps located at Teros, and that began work around 430 to 420 BC. From this developed the two main strands of South Italian painting in Apulia, the heel of Italy, the ornate and the plain styles. This Apulian pottery would come to the fore in the next century, when vase painters in Italy began to block Athenian work out of the market in the West. But that's for another episode. Toward the end of the century, the so-called rich style of Attic sculpture, as seen on the Temple of Athena Nike, is reflected in a contemporary vase painting with an ever greater attention to incidental detail, such as hair and jewelry. The mightiest painter usually is the artist most closely identified with this style, he flourished from around 420 to 400 BC and is named after the potter whose signature is found on a large hydria, which was excavated from an Etruscan tomb. It is now housed in the British Museum. There is no single ground line, but instead the characters are arranged in tiers of friezes across the belly of the vase. The lower half shows Heracles in the Garden of the Hesperides, with the tree whose golden apples they and the dragon are protecting. On the top half, the scene is the Dioscori and their chariots arriving to carry off the daughters of Lycippus. The characters have their arms outstretched and are disposed over the surface at various levels and in various postures, like with the Niobid painter earlier. The artist's rendition of drapery makes no attempt to conceal the female bodies. He pays particular attention to the details of clothing, jewelry, and hair, and all of his women wear earrings, necklaces, hair ornaments, and bracelets. Their hair is rendered with individual elaborate locks and are dressed in a multifolded peplos. His subject matter on his other vases also favor myth over daily life, and given that he worked at the height of the Peloponnesian War, it might show an air of escapist fantasy. On the next episode, after having looked at the changes of painted works in the 5th century BC, let us continue our deep dive into classical art by turning our attention next to monumental architecture. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 58, Classical Temples. 